So at Kenilworth Union this fall, we are preaching a sermon series called Imagined Scarcity, Abundant Reality, which of course comes from Walter Brueggemann's prayer, which Joe read so movingly just a moment ago. It's a sermon series about generosity, how appropriate for Stewardship Sunday, right? So our passage this morning is from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 9. Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth sometimes gets uh, lost in the shadow of the more beloved 1 Corinthians, but there's really some beautiful passages in here, and this is good for us to hear this morning. Paul writes to his friends, the Corinthians, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in your good work. The one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that God has given you. Thanks be to God for God's inexpressible gift. Pray with me. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth is a lot like that letter you recently received from George Wishart and me, or like the ones you get all the time from your alma mater or the art museum. It was a fundraising letter. It's the middle of the first century. The church in Jerusalem, the Christian church in Jerusalem, is suffering some hard times, and Paul wants to take up a collection to help them out. And he's asking the daughter Gentile churches in Greece and Asia Minor to contribute to this fund. Now, Paul doesn't tell us why the church in Jerusalem was suffering. Some biblical scholars think that there may have been a famine in Palestine during the first century. Others have suggested that the church in Jerusalem was undergoing particularly bad times because those Christians were Jewish, of course. And any Jew who believed that Jesus was the Messiah was excommunicated from his synagogue and kicked out of his family. They often lost their jobs. St. Paul asked the church of Corinth to make a donation to the Jerusalem church. Now, you have to know that Corinth was filthy rich. It was a sprawling, brawling, booming harbor town, a thriving port city, something like Los Angeles or New York, I suppose, flush with cash because of its pro prosperous foreign trade. The Christians at Corinth were probably the wealthiest Christians in the church during the first century. Now, in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul shows himself to be a crafty little fundraiser. Paul is the George Wishart of the first century. First, Paul appeals to their pride. He tells them that he's been bragging about the Corinthian church to the churches in Macedonia. He says he's darn proud of their generosity and of their faith. So let me try that time-tested fundraising strategy. I can genuinely say that I am proud of this congregation. $2.2 million in contributions. An average pledge of $3,368 per family. Not bad. Could be higher from folks such as we, but not bad. Thank you for turning your abstract Christian convictions into cold, hard, dense, concrete cash for the use of Jesus Christ and his ministry in this place. And then, after appealing to their pride, Paul appeals to their competitiveness. He says, now listen, friends, far be it from me to suggest how much you ought to contribute, 
but let me let you in on a little secret. The churches in Macedonia, who don't have half as much as you do, have already sent boatloads of cash to Jerusalem. Now, you aren't going to let those poor people over there outdo you in giving, are you? This is another time-tested fundraising strategy. Set up a friendly little race to see who can give the most. My friend Rich raises money in the development office at the dental school of a prestigious, anonymous Midwestern University which once had a great football team. Rich says that whenever he goes out among the alumni to raise funds for some program which promises to eradicate tooth decay forever, he will call on successful alumnus Dr. Jones, for example, And Dr. Jones agrees to give the dental school $50,000. And Rich says to Dr. Jones, well, Dr. Jones, thank you so much. That's so generous. That's almost half of what Dr. Jaspers down the street gave. And then Dr. Jones is not going to be outdone by Dr. Jaspers, so he ups his gift to $150,000. This is what Paul does with the Corinthian church. You aren't going to let that other church outgive you, are you? And, of course, they're not, so they up the ante. And the church at Jerusalem benefits richly from this sacred competitiveness. Paul brings even the spirit of competition into the ministry of Christ. And I'm not above that either. I'll repeat what Paul says to the church at Corinth. Each of you must give how you've made up your mind, and yet let me share something with you. Per member giving at Kenilworth Union Church is almost $900. Pretty good. But I'll share something with you. Per member giving in the entire Presbyterian Church USA is $1,200. I'm trying to generate a little holy competitiveness here. So this fall at Kenilworth Union, we've been talking about the virtue of generosity. Someone said that generosity is the magnitude that gives meaning to existence. I love that phrase, the magnitude that gives meaning to existence. Generosity is moral and spiritual size. Generosity is spaciousness, creating room. Do you know people who confront the world with a pinched and narrow aspect? Don't mention any names. Someone who is not so much bad as small, parsimonious with praise, abstemious with affection, illiberal with laughter, stingy with resources. You know, of course, that the words miser and miserable come from the same Latin source, misere, which means wretched, deplorable, unhappy. Remember what Ebenezer Scrooge was like before that harrowing night of that quartet of ghosts? A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret, self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. Misers are invariably miserable. Generous means large. It's not always a compliment, but sometimes a restaurant review will warn you that a restaurant offers generous portions. Kind of a mixed bag, right? Mixed blessing. Food's not very good, but at least there's a lot of it. Generous portions. Generous means size and spaciousness of spirit, largeness in living, a plenitude of gratitude, for the multiple benedictions with which God has littered the path of your life. That's why so many Americans are so stricken after the death of Ruth Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This was a tiny person who lived large. She convinced us to include in our world the excluded, to make sure that all human beings were judged by the same standard. She's created space for all Americans. And this contrasts so vividly with those who only want to build walls, make quotas, and set limits. You know who else lived a spacious life? Doug Petrie, Judy too. 
Doug was smart. He was funny. He was unfailingly positive. He encouraged and supported everyone in his world, especially at the church. In 1992, Kenilworth Union's anniversary, a centennial anniversary, Judy and Doug coaxed three other church families into donating $100,000 each for the underwriting of theological educations for deserving seminarians. So, 28 years ago, a generous gift of $400,000. Funds been buying MDiv scholarships for almost three decades. So last year, Doug came to see me to find out if that fund had zeroed out yet. Not in this economy. We've been buying MDivs for 30 years, and yet now, in 2019, that fund was worth $1.4 million. And so Doug and Judy decided to make a contribution from that fund to McCormick Theological Seminary on Chicago's south side, which serves a constituency very different from our sons and daughters. Largest scholarship gift McCormick had ever received. I'm not sure I'm even supposed to be telling you this. Maybe that original gift was supposed to be anonymous. But Doug is gone, and Judy will forgive me. The magnitude which gives meaning to existence. Life in God's spirit is not microbial, but galactic. It is not infinitesimal, but infinite. It is not provincial, but global like Doug. So we will practice jubilant generosity. Paul writes to his friends in Corinth, God loves a cheerful giver. And the Greek word Paul uses for cheerful is hilaron, from which we get our word hilarious. Cheerful doesn't quite capture the size of what Paul's talking about. God loves a hilarious giver, a boisterously joyful one, jubilant generosity, a person so caught up in the joy of giving that after a while she doesn't even realize what she's doing, casting money hither and yon with abandon. And then she becomes an object of hilarity. You give how much to the United Way, the Cancer Fund? Kenilworth Union Church you give how much? Peter Gomes puts it like this Peter Gomes the beloved eloquent minister to Harvard's Memorial Church Peter Gomes says be extravagant in your expectations lavish in your hopes and ambitious in your aspirations especially for others John Harvard was an ab- a deservedly obscure English clergyman of no particular claim to fame, and no one knew him then, and no one would know him now, but for one fact. He made an extravagant gesture, an act of generosity in the form of giving away all of his books and half of his money, and we have been living off him ever since. So friends, jubilant generosity. Be extravagant in your expectations, lavish in your hope, ambitious in your aspirations, especially for others, for God loves a cheerful giver in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.